Thanks, Kevin. Um, so no pressure going first right after an astronaut, um, but I'm going to try my best. Um, so I'm Drishti uh, here with Facebook. Um, some of you might remember I was here with Red Cross the past two times. Um, but I'm super excited to tell you what Facebook has been doing. Uh, last year, we had a really cool talk from Yin, who is an amazing engineer and had started the AI um, part for OSM. And so this year, we're basically going to give you a recap of what we've done over the past year and give you some updates on where we are. So how many people even know about Maps and Facebook? OK, that's pretty good. Um, it's actually more than even Facebook, because a lot of the times, are even people within our own company, because you know there's 20-something thousand of them, are like, we have Facebook Maps? Like, what do we do? Um, so it's, it's not that popular, or it's not something people may recognize unless you're in the mapping world. or um, if you, But you'll see it a lot in places like check-in places, messenger location. Um, and what we found is that there's actually a high engagement when people can see the maps and they can see what's around them um, and can look at that little piece. And I think a lot of people recognize it from when you're flying. That's like one of the, the big use cases of where people see maps. But it's also used for recommendations and fun stuff. So why do we care about OSM at Facebook? So at Facebook, our mission is to make the world more open and connected. Um, specifically within our connectivity lab, uh, we're focusing on understanding the world and how to make it more connected. And we know that 10% of the world's population is completely unconnected, so without power and internet. Um, and so we're trying to see how we can reach those people. And we believe that mapping is one of the ways that can get us there, and so our team is basically taking the task to increase the coverage in the world map. And what you guys see uh, behind is basically analysis that we started doing to figure out what the road coverage was like. So you see the hot pink areas um, are places that we don't actually have a lot of coverage, so between 0 to 20 percent. But we know lots of people live there. And so what we're trying to do is basically fill out those areas. And this is pretty common with a lot of the maps. You'll see the more developed countries or traditionally more developed will have a lot more map data. But the minute you go out of those areas, it starts to get more and more sparse. And in some cases, there's nothing at all. But we definitely know people live there. So one of the use cases for OSM, in addition to the fact that it's open and we have this great collaborative energy around OSM, is that it allows us to move a lot more fast um, because we can customize the data, style the data, um, and do what we want with it very quickly, um, which normally in more traditional uh, senses would take us a long time to contract it out and take a couple months designing it. And this is an example of live maps, which was done in about a week with two engineers who have no map background. And so they were able to kind of look at the OSM, st OSM structure. This was a while before um, we started the OSM work. So it's pretty cool what you can do with it really quickly. So our overall process um, is basically we create our own training data. And we use the digital globes vivid imagery, which is high resolution. And then run it through these machine learning algorithms, the magic that happens with the engineers. And then it's post-processed into vectors, which basically makes it the same as the OSM data. And so then we can play with it much better, merge with OSM, go through a bunch of human editing before we um, end up putting it into OSM. And then we also have some post-validation stuff. So how is this even possible, right? So there's uh, two things that have made it really easy to do. Um, one, that's deep learning. So being able to use artificial neural nets with multiple layers so we can look at the imagery in much more detailed scope. And the second is access to high resolution imagery. So that wasn't readily available a couple of years ago. And now you can basically buy it off the shelf, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the third thing, which is not a tech um, advancement that I think helps make it, is having a really passionate team. Um, obviously, super proud of mine. Um, but everyone's super involved, um, gets to know the OSM structure. Obviously, not everyone's from an OSM background, but have taken the time to figure out how it all plays and works together. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the challenges, because a lot of the questions we get is like, how is it even possible? Um, you know, there's such bad imagery, and there's clouds. And that's true, and you can see it, the imagery, um, especially when you get into the more developing countries where um, roads are unpaved, they vary in width, texture, color. Um, all of these things make it really hard to look at the imagery. Um, and then there's clouds. And in some areas of the world, we know there's always clouds, which um, thankfully, with the vivid stuff, we're uh, seeing less. 
So what we've done to mitigate some of the challenges that we see here is created our own training data. And what this means is we have about 20 editors that go through and hand select images within that area so you get a really good variation of let's say we're working in South Thailand, um, like an urban area, more rural area, different types of colors and textures. And then we go through Photoshop and actually label every single street, um, regardless of the area. And that, that's what makes us have a good training data set. Each time we move to a new area, we're changing our algorithm a little bit, and then we're also um, creating new training data. And we need less and less as we go because the model gets better. But that's kind of how we solve some of those challenges. So after the fun machine learning stuff, we get a mask, which is basically a raw output. Um, this is basically a grayscale image where the brightness indicates the confidence of whether a pixel is a road or not. So you'll start to see all the white lines are actually what it's picking up as a high confidence road. And then next. Um, we get a lot of questions about false positives, so this is where we fix that. We go through and basically apply a really high threshold over this image, and what it does is it picks out only things that are super high confidence, and you can see the difference between these two. You actually see a lot more um, gaps, so the roads start to get fragmented, and this could be, let's say you have a long road, there's tree cover or um, some kind of vegetation or shadows, and that little piece is not quite visible, and this can happen with human mapping too, um, those actually go away, even though the machine has picked them up. And then we extract a center line, and then followed by that, we go through and connect the roads where we have confidence. So this is kind of how we avoid some of that, um, the false positives. Uh, at this point, we also compare it to current OSM, and we remove everything of ours that's a duplicate. So if it's already an OSM, we just delete it from, from ours. Um, we go through and connect it. And then we, uh, put after, part of the post-processing is also removing island roads. So these are the little pieces of roads that the machine has detected, but they're not connected to the overall network. So we know they're there, and if you look at the more rural areas or uh, where there's a lot of veget vegetation, um, especially based on seasons, you see a piece of the road and then trees grow and then all of a sudden you don't know where that path or track is leading to. So we remove those just so it's not confusing, but they actually do exist. Um, then we convert it into an OSM format so we can merge it with current uh, data in OSM. And we do this just before we edit so we can kind of resolve some of the issues of like the gap between when people edit and, and when we add our data. This is an example of ID that we basically uh, brought down and changed to add some of the JOS and validations that we have, um, our own checks and balances. Um, and you can imagine with 20 people having a process, our engineers sit in one building, the, the editors sit in a different building. So we're a little bit spread out, so it helps us to have like very automated process and toolings, um, the way we can just like flow through the process much easier, and then there's checks for each of them as we go forward. Um, so this is why we chose to use ID for our editing versus JOSM, because it was a much easier way for us to integrate into the overall process. Um, and you can see what we've done is kind of use the same uh, idea of paint styles and JOSM, um, highlighted the things that are definitely uh, from machine learning, so we double check all of that stuff. Um, we also have things like lint tags, so people know when they're correcting. Uh, another tool that we've used from open source is a tasking manager, which we've changed quite a bit to basically make it a project management tool in addition to tasking out areas. Um, and so this helps us track metrics, see how people are doing, see where we're having errors. We also, we've, we also have a third uh, step, um, so we, we edit things three times before we submit it. So we have our first editors take a pass, and then our validators go through, and then there's a final publisher that will look through it again before um, actually submitting it to OSM, in addition to some of the live editing that we'll do um, that we have constant uh, checks for. Um, all of these levels are basically levels that people get through uh, with enough like training, peer review, um, and once we feel that they're confident enough to do the next level, we kind of move them. So before someone becomes a publisher, they've usually been with us for a long time. Um, this is an example of, of ID to show you some of the things we've done. Um, so I don't know if you can see it in this image real uh, clearly, but right here is the grid. So because our editors are doing this eight hours a day, every day, um, they've found like really efficient ways that they can make their 
process uh, better. And we have recommendations that come in all the time and people create tasks, we go over it as a group to think if it's the right thing to do, kind of look at it overall and, and create it. And this was one of the ideas that came up. So even within a task in very dense areas, it's really hard to keep track of where you are. This happens with a lot of mapping. So we have different grids that people can choose. So they can see exactly the little dot that uh, of where they are, um, but then they can also go grid by grid um, checking the work. Um, we also have the lint tags, which you can see. So in addition to just visually looking it, uh, we can also click through them and basically solve all the issues uh, before we move forward. If you don't solve any, uh, if, you, if it still has issues, it actually won't let you move to the next level. Um, so there's a lot of like places where we've incorporated actual blocks to make sure that um, nothing goes through that shouldn't be. Um, so that's basically ID. Um, so who are the mappers? This is basically our team. They're super diverse. These are from team events. Um, they come from all different parts of the world. So this is basically where everyone has either come from or lived uh, for a significant amount of time. Overall, speak about 22 languages, uh, but within Facebook, the nice thing is we also have access to a ton of other employees from very, very different areas, an internationalization team, um, all of the folks in connectivity. So, you know, language is something uh, we're super lucky to have. So uh, that basically helps us with the local context of where we're mapping to understand what it's like, look at, look at signs, look at um, kind of local editing and, and what that's like. So one of the things that we've, we've uh, made very, very uh, significant part of our team is feedback. Um, and this wasn't an easy thing when we started. A lot of people came from different places and that fearless feedback was, wasn't just a thing uh, that we talk about, but we actually incorporate it right into our process. So people have to give feedback. If you reject a tile for any reason, you have to say what it's about, talk to the person. But then we also talk each week about everything that's happening, what we're learning. Um, we take the community feedback really seriously. So everything goes into a very public uh, forum within our team. We discuss it so that, you know, if one person gets a comment, the entire team is aware of exactly what happened, how we solve it, how we move forward, and we do replies basically as a team. Um, we try to be super responsive, but you know, there's weekends and stuff, so sometimes it's not always 24 hours. Um, we've also taken that out into the community as well, so we take that feedback really well. Uh, got a chance to travel to Thailand because that's our first pilot. This is the country we're working on, um, and so we got to meet the community, which was super cool. We all know everyone by username, so it was really nice to put a personality to people. So one of the editors we constantly saw was like at Leo, um, we realized Tom Leo was a retired ER doctor living in Thailand and spends like a significant amount of his time mapping, which is so amazing. Uh, so that was pretty cool to have live feedback. So in summary, I'm going to play that uh, video Kevin was talking about. Hopefully the music works. Um, but this is kind of the overall process.
So that was done by our friends at ITO World. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with them. Um, so this is a quick map of density, of basically how it's changed over the last couple of months. Um, and then since that video, we've actually done a little bit more. So in Thailand, we've finished about 26 of the provinces, uh, over 5,000 of those tasks, because we split up the country into squares, uh, 200,000 ways, uh, 100,000 kilometers of road, and about 2 million nodes. Um, so this is kind of what a before and after looks like. So you can see even areas that kind of look like they're mapped still could use a little bit more. Um, and then going to road type. So uh, figuring, that's the only other attribute that we add other than the actual geometry. And we get this from satellite imagery, studying local edits, talking uh, to local community, OSM wikis. But we also have population density maps, which basically follows the similar process of how we extract roads from satellite imagery, uh, but for population. And this yellow image is kind of what it looks like once they've figured out where all the uh, houses are. And we basically use that to help us with tagging. And this is not like an algorithmic like thing that just tags all of the roads, but gives us a sense of where we have residential roads especially. So you can see the yellow in this image is actually picking up all the houses. Um, one thing that was really cool that we've seen in Thailand is after we've put in the geometry, we've had a lot, a lot of local uh, mappers go in and actually put in the street names. Um, and that was one of the reasons we actually started with road geometry. It's one of the hardest things to do in crowdsource because it's so long, it spans multiple boxes. It's not always done right by new mappers. Um, so we thought this would have the most significant impact, which other data can then be added on. So another thing at Facebook that we're experimenting with is crowdsourcing of road names. So we have a lot of users, basically, and we can uh, we know from the place, places data graph that we have that you know there's X number of uh, places on a street, and we know what street name they are, and so we can crowdsource back with a specific name asking if this is the correct name. Uh, so we tried it in Thailand, and we got about 66,000 roads uh, with pretty high confidence because they're based on people actually um, responding based on the places and pages that local uh, people in Thailand had already placed. Um, as far as QA, we have a customized ID, which we've seen, and will be open sourced, is in the process. Uh, we also do the JOSM validation with the same paint styles, and then from some other friends that are here, we've created OSM Cha, Osmos, and Keep Right. Uh, we also run those daily. Um, and then real quick, uh, some of the successes are obviously the technology we've been uh, pretty happy with and have a really high precision recall. Um, our geometry has improved quite a bit. The overall process went from being a technical process to very community-driven, understanding local edits um, and kind of overall more efficient process. Um, and obviously the new imagery has been pretty amazing. That's an ID, so that's super helpful because it's the same as ours. And some of the, the challenges we found was understanding the actual import process because, you know, there's no there's none for machine learning uh, assisted roads. So it's something we had to figure out and we've you know, been going through that of, of what's actually required, what people would like to know more about. So we're completely open to comments and feedback. Um, one of the things we've had a problem with the lag time between when if we're editing and we wait a couple of days and then submit it because we're going through internal validation and someone makes a, a local edit, that sometimes becomes an issue for areas that are highly mapped. Um, and then what do we do when there's no local community? So in Thailand, there's probably like three or four really active people, uh, which is still a small amount compared to a lot of places, but you know, where there is no uh, community to kind of like approve the process, like what are kind of, we're thinking through like what the, the challenges would be. Um, so I think I have one minute. Uh, okay, one minute. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in, in respect for the next two people that are gonna speak, I'll probably wait for our questions later. I'll be around, the engineers are around, uh, ask them all the hard questions. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And then just, uh, these are kind of machine learning um, straight raw images that were produced, so you can kind of see exactly what the machine pops out for different types of areas. And yeah, that's pretty much it, thanks.